Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you for your amazing grace to us. Indeed, for you have saved us, love us while we are still sinners. Thank you, Father, for your love that pursues us and never lets us go. Help us, dear Lord, as we may respond to your love and grace and love one another and love others. As we praise you, we invite your Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts and in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By this video? Loud Voice is a donation funded ministry dedicated to spreading God's love through free audio and video content. If you were blessed, don't forget to subscribe and also do consider supporting us today. Thank you! For scripture reading this morning, let's turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 18, verse 25. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to this text. Exodus, chapter 18, verse 25. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And Moses 
chose able, able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. May the Lord bless us as we meditate on these words. All right, once again, happy Sabbath. Okay, good. We are continuing in our series, uh, which is Growing Young. And uh, with that in mind, uh, last time I spoke about how our church can grow young, right? How our young people are valuable. How we must see that it is not something that is, uh, it just doesn't matter or somebody else's problem. But rather, if each one is our own children, wouldn't we give everything for them? And I thought today we'd like to continue in the next part of the series, and it's the idea of key chain leadership. And uh, before we dive into it, I thought I'd like to explain to us a few types of frames that we might view this idea of, of leadership. Uh, so we have here, first, the structural frame that when we view church primarily through our roles and responsibilities. So you have your tasks, I have different tasks. So different tasks that we have. Second, you view church in a way that's more relational. Uh, you think that everything is based on relationships, how different persons desire, how to do life together. As long as we're all together doing life, it's great. There's another way to view church, and that's through a symbolic frame. And that is primarily you see church as stories, going through different rituals, having different spiritual practices. As the people, as leaders, as a spiritual guide, as a one who is a wise person, a sage or a prophet. And I thought with these three frames in mind, uh, first let me say there's nothing wrong with any of the frames. Uh, we all have different ways of doing things. And they are all needed at different times. But I'd like to understand from your perspective, and that's where we have our mentee, what do you perceive is our church leadership frame currently? And then uh, number two would be, what do you perceive is your personal leadership frame? So we start with the first one. Uh, what is your, what do you view is our church leadership frame? Okay. Okay, as we are looking at it, let me see. Give me a moment as we fill up. Next slide, okay, we are done. We move to the next slide. Okay, the next slide is, I have now placed there. You can now look. How do you view your leadership frame as well? Okay, so we can answer that too. As we look at the different frames as we answer, Indeed, the different frames, the idea is that the best churches, the best leadership teams will have people from all different frames. Right? If you're all only one type or the other, there's parts of life that are missing. You know? So in church, we will need all different kinds of people. Okay? Let's take a look at uh, some of our answers we have. Uh, we invite you to continue to fail. Okay, now we have some of the answers in. How do you view your church leadership frame? Uh, of the different answers, the first, structural, we have uh, nine of them. Uh, relational, we have nine as well. And symbolic, we have four, okay? So uh, or relational is increasing a little bit now to 11. So we do see that there are different views of how our church runs. And that's perfectly fine because it's not that we only exercise one type of leadership all the time, but rather that there are different times we will have different ways of doing things. But of course, by nature, as a person, we may have certain tendencies and run things in a certain way. But how about uh, our personal ones as well? Oh, it seems that people who answered also answered very similarly for structural 9 and relational 11 and symbolic 2. So people view the church and they feel that they are also 
perhaps the same as uh, those who have answered in terms of their own leadership frame. Perhaps uh, you may be the leader answering this and you feel that is the answer. However, as we look at it today, we, we, I want to ask that no matter which view, which uh, type of leader you might be, our church needs you because you are important and you bring something to the table that each of us, someone else, cannot bring. What I can bring to the table is something that what you can bring. And that is why each one matters. Each one can share something. It can help us to grow our church a little further forward together. Of course, sometimes we may be like, ah, leave it to someone else. But when that happens, definitely we are missing out on something. Let's take a look a little further. If we look at the story of Jethro and Moses in Exodus 18, as read, Jethro himself was a non-Israelite. He was there, he came, Moses shared with him all the different things, how God had worked through them, through saving them through the Red Sea, through the miracles in Egypt, giving them manna daily. And because of that, he heard of what God had done, he believed. And as he believed, here he took the burnt offering and sacrifices to offer to God. And then uh, Aaron as well came and with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Jethro, symbolizing that they had accepted him into the community. So they accepted Jethro. He was new, uh, but they accepted him. But what is interesting is for someone being new, uh, he was looking at how Moses ran things. Right? Moses was from morning to night, listening and judging all the different cases brought to him. He was doing all day, all night, and things could not finish. And so he felt this was not good. And though being new, uh, he was inspired to give advice. And as he gave advice, there was different responses from different groups of people. Right? On one hand, we may have Aaron and Miriam. They were not happy. They were the ones that were beside Moses. Right? When they had crossed the Red Sea, Miriam was the one who led all the women to celebrate the success of God leading them through the Red Sea. Aaron was the one who was chosen as the high priest. He was the right-hand man of Moses. Right? When Moses was away, he was in charge. And so when Moses listened to the advice of his father-in-law Jethro, they were not happy. They were wondering why they had not been consulted, why they, Moses went ahead without them. And they were angry and they felt that Moses uh, stepped by them and just ignored them and went ahead. And they represent, in a sense, leaders who are holding, we call hold, key holding leaders. Right? They are the one who holds on to the keys. They refuse to give others the access. They must be the one who run the show. Right? When there are others, they're unhappy. They will complain to God. They, they gather people against Moses. They were unhappy. Right? Of course, Moses, uh, God did not agree with them. And uh, for those who know the story, uh, Miriam was struck with leprosy. Uh, they prayed, asked Moses to pray to God uh, for forgiveness and eventually she was out of the camp and later was healed. Sometimes we, hopefully, of course, we never have to experience something as drastic, but at times we might be, what kind of leader are we? Could we sometimes hold the keys and don't want to give to others? What are other kinds of leaders that are mentioned? A keyless leader, one that is often young, inexperienced, one that has, doesn't actually have the keys, but tries their very best to prove that, you know, I can lead. They try their very best, but maybe they can't. Key holding leader we have mentioned, they try to hold on and run the show all by themselves. We have key loaning leaders, leaders that take it off the key and try to give others temporarily, and as soon as you're done with your job, okay, I'll take back my leadership and responsibility. Sometimes, we may do that as well. Uh, in church, we may say, ah, uh, you do all the work and then uh, I will just there and let, you, let people. Sometimes we like to say right, in life, I, uh, just some, you, you know, when we have this idea where people are given the keys, sometimes as uh, young people who may be given the keys to the house, that is a good thing. But many times in church, we may say, I, uh, I'm getting old, give all the young people do everything, uh, let them have all the authority. But there is also a danger in that. And then the young people respond, ah, uh, we're so few of us, so many of you, we are also feeling burdened, right? And that is not the way to go, right? It's dumping the keys right, to people, say, okay, you have it all, do whatever you want. That is also not the way 
to go. If we look at the idea of keychain leadership, is to be aware of the keys, the keys meaning the different leadership roles that we hold. When we can constantly open doors for some and entrust others with others who are ready. I think it's important to realize that people are ready. Right? Sometimes, as I mentioned in church, we are eager to try to push to give someone else to do it, eager to dump it away. But the key of entrusting is important. It's important as we look at it together. If you look at Moses, uh, one who was a humble person, he was one who was a humble man. God called him the meekest man on earth. He was generous, he was noble, he was well-balanced, he was not defective. His qualities were not half-developed. He could successfully exhort his fellow men because he himself represented what man can become and accomplish with God as his helper. What he thought of others, desired them to be, and what God required of him. He spoke from the heart and he reached the heart. I think that is a key point, huh? Pastor Chan likes to remind me. Speak from the heart to reach the heart. That is something that Moses did. He was accomplished in knowledge and simple as a child in manifestation of his deep sympathies. And though with remarkable instincts, he could judge instantly all the needs who surrounded him and the things which were in bad condition and required attention, he did not neglect them. If we look at the story of uh, Moses himself, he could do everything, right? He could listen from morning to night. He was patient. Uh, I think if we have ever tried to solve problems, we know it can wear us down. But Moses himself, he was very patient. He could do it from morning to night, day after day after day, and continue. Wow, right? I don't think I'm as patient as him, but it's remarkable, right? Don't you think? Um, but Moses, though he could do such a thing, and though he was the leader chosen by God, he was open to feedback. He was open to his father-in-law, Jethro, sharing with him there was a better way to do things, to appoint others, as we read. And I think that is important to note, that Moses himself learned how to entrust others at the right time. He found people, men of faith, men of responsibility. He found the people who were ready and appointed them, as Pastor Chan read earlier, of hundreds, fifties, and tens. They were given the opportunity as they were ready. As we look at it together, we may ask ourselves uh, different things. How are different leaders who may lead us today? Give me a moment. If we look at it uh, together, sometimes we may see that uh, we think that just because we want to cater to new ways of doing things, we may feel that Okay, as I mentioned, we may feel that everything you give to younger people. When we look at this survey uh, in the book Growing Young, it says only one in 10 mentioned having younger leaders for the reason why church is effective with younger people. Meaning, uh, it's not that just because we have all the young people lead out, therefore the church is effective now. But rather, that is not the answer. Many here in the survey shows that they wish that more adults had their more connections with those in the older generation. If you remember the last sermon, I invited us to form further connections with the young people, whether to open our house, if you remember, to the young people in care group, uh, join in the visitation ministry, share your cars to send them, as well as uh, perhaps open your house for them to visit on Sabbath afternoons. These are a reminder and a call once again to be involved. And that is what the research shows as well. And so this maturity is found and takes over time. What, one of the things of being a keychain leader is being mature. That maturity is important. And here, Moses himself had the opportunity to mature. Right? He realized he made mistakes in life sometimes seemingly more serious than ours. He killed right, an Egyptian. He killed another fellow Israelite. Wow, I think in today's system, he will be definitely in jail. But somehow he escaped to the wilderness and God worked in his heart for 40 years in the wilderness as he grew and matured. So here, one is saying is that leaders are called to be mature. Second, leaders are called to be real, not relevant. I think... Sometimes in the light of feeling that we must do everything impossible to remain relevant, we feel that everything must change, right? The, 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 the things like maybe the worship must be different. The, the things 
must be of new age. But that's not necessarily the case. More important than how everything is running is our relationship. People can sense, are we authentic? Are we real? Can, is this person genuine? Are they vulnerable? And so here it says 13% focus on how their leaders are relevant, whereas 87% talk about how authentic or other qualities unrelated to relevance. Real is more important than relevance. Are we genuine? Are we warm? Are we caring? Are we transparent? I don't know if I'm transparent enough in my processes. I think there's something I open feedback to us to share as well. And that is being real, to be more transparent in what we do, to be more vulnerable. Next, we look at the idea that, uh, sorry, some of the slides are not there. Uh, Keychain leaders are warm, not distant. This idea of mentorship. Right? That's why I invite us once again to our discipleship group this afternoon because we are called to mentor others. We are called to say, here, I am here for you. We are called to be warm. Right? Sometimes we see the problem, as I mentioned the last time. We may see, how come this is happening? Why are they like this? Right? But who we sense, when is the opportunity that we can connect with them, connect with others, say, you did a great job. Say, this is something that I'm proud of you of. Have you had the opportunity to say something to encourage others rather than only taking the opportunity when there are flaws to be had? He says, when young people ask what made their church effective, 43% pointed to the relational nature of their leaders, specifically that they were caring accepting or enjoying to be with. Yeah. So, warm. Yeah. Six, th the third one is about being warm. When they feel that warmth, that the question we ask ourselves, right? Is our church warm? I heard last week our church was very warm, the aircon spoil. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I mean, I believe that our church is growing in the right direction, and uh, we we can be. Yeah, I think we uh, we are. I believe we have heard many good testimonies from the visitors in past times of our warm church, and we can continue to grow in that direction. Okay, next, key chain leaders know what matters to people. Uh, what matters is comes with listening. Right? I think I'm also at fault with this. Many times uh, as pastor, it's very easy to talk and talk and talk. I realize even when I talk to my wife, I spend most of the time talking and listening less. Uh, as I was trying to spend time with her yesterday, I tried my best, though maybe not good enough, <laughs> to try to listen a little more and understood what actually matters to her in serving. And I started to learn things I didn't know about, right, that she wanted to serve together with me. I was like, oh, what have I been doing? Have I been trying to ask her to serve on her own one corner and then I serve on my own the other corner? And there is part and parcel when it comes to learning what matters to others. As I reflect on this, I realize that I also need to hear a little more what matters to you. Please share with me as I also uh, want to know what matters to you. You may not want to enjoy serving in a certain place. Let me know. You may not enjoy working with certain people. Well, let me know as well. Uh, so we want to know what matters to you in serving as a person. Teaching leaders entrust and empower others. They don't try to be a super man, super person. Here we see Moses, he originally tried to be a superman, but Jeshua told him, right, to empower others, appoint the hundreds, fifty, tens, thousands, and he did. He no longer was the superman. Even myself, sometimes we are tempted to be the superman. Every week, I must be the one to make announcements. Sometimes there's this tendency. Right? We learn that it is not the way. Right? We entrust others. Jesus himself, though he could, is the son of God, he could do every single thing. He empowered 12 disciples, right, to carry on the work. He empowered his closer three to carry on his work. And it's not that he just empowered them. It's not that he just uh, throw it to them and say, okay, your problem now, and then let them go. Right? He trained them. He sent them out for the 70, two by two. When they faced problems, he helped them out. Right? When they could not cast out demons, he helped them out. When they were failing, he did not give up on them. When Peter was going to deny him, 
Jesus did not say, oh, now you fail already, you can no longer be the leader. He didn't do that. Right? He didn't say, okay, since you're going to fail, I'm going to take over, now your time has come to an end. Jesus did not do that. And I thought today, as we look at it together, we ask ourselves, are we leaders? What kind of leaders are we? We're all leaders in one aspect or the other, right? As leaders in our home, leaders in church, non-appointed leaders. But we're all leaders in one way or another. And the question we ask ourselves is, are we the leaders that God called us to be? Are we warm? Are we real? Are we one that listens to others? Are we one that tries to connect with others? And these are questions that we ask ourselves today. That how can we take the role to mentor others? How can we not just dumb everything to others, but take the chance to mentor? I think this is something that I will invite, especially our leaders who will be continuing in the next two years, or starting in the next two years, to start thinking of someone you can disciple, train in your ministry, in future, that they can also lead, whether together with you, or when you choose to take a break, per se. That will be the thing to go for. And for us who may be thinking how we can grow in this direction for a growing young church. Last round we shared that we all cannot live forever, right? But our ideals, the things can live on through the next generation. And the way that we can live on in this way is by investing in others, in discipling them. And so the question we ask today is, are we willing to consider the step to disciple others? Are we willing to take the step to build relationships further with our young people? Are we willing to take a little sacrifice or inconvenience to say, next time when I see something that I don't like, I won't criticize. I will find ways to encourage. I will find ways that I can do things differently. Perhaps that may be something that we can look at. And as we look at the idea of Jesus as a leader as well, he was one who did not give up on others. When Peter was going to deny him, he said, I pray for you that you may not fail, right? That Satan may not overcome you. He tried his best for Peter. When Peter failed him, eventually, he did not say, okay, you have failed, that's the end. He called him back and asked him, do you love me? And asked him to feed his sheep. As we look at it, in life, we fail, right? There are times we fail. We may see that our young people seem to fail. But what is our response to them? Do we say, okay, you fail, that's it? Or do we say, how can I redeem them? How can I encourage? How can I help the person in their next step of their journey? As we were looking to the food washing soon, uh, yesterday, for the very first time in my life, uh, I had the chance to wash my wife's feet. How many of us have ever washed our spouse's feet before, or family members? Ah, okay, a good, uh, some number of us. If you have not, I encourage you to try it. Because we had a good conversation uh, yesterday, and uh, having a chance to hear uh, different struggles, as I mentioned, listening, trying hard. And I think what better way than to practice with our family members? Sometimes we try to let our guard down and be our true self. But sometimes being our true self, we may be not so nice to them, right? But as a chance we had to talk, to share, and I had to realize the parts that I may not have been so, uh, that I've been missing as a leader or perhaps as also a husband. We had a chance to talk, cry together, forgive each other, and move forward in life. As before we may be able to step out and help, help others, perhaps we can start with the very first step. Uh, you have the chance to also, of course, wash one another's feet later. But take the chance, maybe tonight, if you may consider. You can wash your spouse's feet. Have a chance to, to practice some of the things, to be warm. Have the chance to practice the opportunity to be listening. Have the chance to be, do something different, reconcile. And let the chance of the opportunity of that relationship grow. We may not be perfect leaders, but God has called us nevertheless to lead in where we can, to be real where possible, 
to be warm, to listen. And so today, as we may share the next part of it, I ask us to consider these things, that as we wash one another's feet later, remembering Jesus as a leader who never gave up on Peter and who never gave up on each of us, Moses himself who entrusted others, will we take the step to also entrust and disciple others? Will we take the step to build warm relationships with others? Will we take the step for the youths, for our spouses, and for the church? Today, before we go and wash our feet, I invite us to consider tonight to wash our spouse's feet, to consider what is the step that we can do something, perhaps a word of encouragement, perhaps something we can do for young people. What is something that we can do as leaders to train somebody else? I invite us to consider that as we pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath morning, as you have given us the opportunity to wash one another's feet, we thank you for never giving up on us. And Father, while it may be difficult for us, we ask that you strengthen us with the Holy Spirit as we desire to be warmer, to be more real, to have a listening ear, to encourage one another, and to, as we also seek to wash one another's feet soon, we ask for your humility to be upon us as we also desire to wash our family's feet. We thank you, dear Lord, for choosing us, for loving us, and for empowering us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we invite us, uh, the gentlemen, to head up there uh, to wash our feet in the upper room and the ladies at the social hall uh, to wash one another's feet in the social hall at the back. And after that, we will return right here and uh, we observe uh, silence as we were have our communion service later on. We may proceed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we have partaken of the communion, we ask God's love to continually fill our hearts. May Jesus strengthen us as we desire to disciple others. And the Holy Spirit help us to be loving to others as we do so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.